right. Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Welcome back. I pray that you had the chance to catch Maghrib. We are running about uh, seven minutes behind schedule or so, but inshallah, we will proceed to the next session, which is, um, it's called Prevention, School-Based Intervention in Muslim Communities. And we will have uh, Dr. Farah Islam here, as well as a video presentation by Dr. Hisham Hamouda. He unfortunately was not able to make it to the conference today, but he gracefully agreed to send us a recording. So what we will do, inshallah, is I will uh, be introducing Dr. Hisham Hamouda. I'll play his video. And then after that, uh, we'll proceed to the section where Dr. Farah Islam will be presenting, inshallah. So a um, little bit about myself. My name is Ibrahim Muhammad. I'm a fourth year medical student at the University of Ottawa. I'm also the conference coordinator. Um, I'd like to remind you that, you know, wh while this session is going on, you may use the Q&A function in the Zoom chat to send questions and the speakers, inshallah, will get to it. Of course, Dr. Hisham Hamoud is not here today, but uh, Dr. Farah Hislam will, will do her best to, to be answering those questions. And another reminder is that all of today's sessions are accredited. And to obtain those hours, we will be sending out a Google form survey after the conference. And you, you just have to fill that out to, to get your credits, inshallah. Last thing, right above me, there's a website called muslimmentalhealth.ca. And if you can't see that, just visit muslimmentalhealth.ca. We have a bunch of resources there. We have uh, we collaborated with the Ruh team to be able to embed their structure into our website. So if you want to find a therapist uh, with specific needs, you want a specific language, for example, you should be able to do that, inshallah. But without further ado, Dr. Hisham Hamouda is a child and adolescent psychiatrist at Boston Children's Hospital, and he is an assistant professor at Harvard Medical School. He is also a diplomat of the American Board of Psychiatry and Neurology in both adult uh, general psychiatry and child and adolescent psychiatry, and he is also board certified in public health. He completed a master's in public health degree from the Harvard Chan School of Public Health. Dr. Hamouda also serves as a vice president of the International Association for Child and Adolescent Psychiatry and Allied Professions, and he has worked as a consultant for the WHO. So without further ado, I'm now going to play the video presentation by Dr. Hisham Hamouda. Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Uh, it's really a great honor to be with you. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, so I'm going to talk today about school-based school interventions in Muslim communities, particularly sharing with you uh, a program that we worked with with the World Health Organization. So thank you again for um, hosting me, and uh, I'm uh, looking forward to uh, uh, this presentation. So I'm going to start with uh, conflicts of interest. Uh, so I don't really have much to share here. I do receive funding from the National Institutes of Mental Health in the U.S. for uh, school mental health work, part of what I'm going to be presenting today. Uh, the NIMH, uh, for those not familiar with it, is a uh, federal agency for uh, the funds uh, research. I've also received uh, WHO World Health Organization funding for various projects, including some of the work also that I'm going to be presenting today. So this is a uh, summary of my presentation. So I'm going to start off talking about why school mental health, why is it important? Then I'm going to talk about the development of the World Health Organization, Eastern Mediterranean Regional Office, School Mental Health Program, uh, some of the impact and research of this work. And then I'm going to just uh, end maybe with selecting, uh, with one case that I selected uh, to just kind of give you a glimpse of the program and the type of interventions that it provides. All right, so schools are very important uh, for mental health promotion and prevention, not just for early identification and uh, supporting students who have problems, but the uh, schools have a very essential role in prevention and promotion. School experiences are important in uh, children's intellectual development, psychological well-being, positive emotional social well-being, greater satisfaction with family and relationships with friends. Hence the importance of uh, teacher training about uh, mental health and having a more proactive approach towards mental health in schools. So schools primary role is academic, right? People go to school to learn. 
right? But uh, to learn, uh, students have to be in a uh, state, uh, uh, emotional state that actually allows that. So uh, school mental health programs are very important also for academic achievement, retention, and decreasing dropouts in schools. There's a lot of literature that supports that uh, children's well-being is linked to their academic achievement. Accessibility is very important. Uh, students spend 15,000 hours, think about that, 15,000 hours uh, from kindergarten to completion of uh, school, to completion of high school. Uh, it's an accessible environment for promotion, prevention, early identification, and it's also a more familiar and less stigmatizing environment, so less threatening environment that allows a lot of students to get support more so than, you know, say, going to a hospital, going to a clinic. And there's an uh, important uh, role of risk reduction, so strengthening protective factors, resilience, and uh, uh, promoting school mental health, decreasing violence and juvenile crime, so there are societal implications for that. Uh, An early identification of mental illness, uh, altering the school experience of these students. It's not just important for students, uh, it's actually important, very important also for teachers. Uh, one of the main reasons uh, of burnout and dropout uh, from the profession of teaching is actually behavioral problems that students have. So this is not just important for the students, but actually really important also for the teachers and their own well-being. The social aspect of school is very important. We know that uh, children develop lasting and very deep relationships with teachers. Probably we can all remember a uh, specific teacher that had, uh, you know, kind of a life lasting um, effect on, uh, uh, on each of us. So uh, the social aspect of school is very important, as well as kind of the peer relationships uh, that develop in schools um, and uh, the connection to the community in general. Schools also influence the adoption of both healthy and unhealthy behaviors. If you think about things like uh, healthy eating, uh, exercise, but also many unhealthy uh, habits like uh, substance abuse, others, you know, a lot of students uh, uh, smoke for the first time maybe in school, uh, uh, start using substances in school. So both healthy and unhealthy behaviors and habits uh, are very much influenced by the school environment. All right, so um, I'm going to now talk a little bit about the WHO EMRO School Mental Health Program. Uh, so a bit of a quick uh, geographical uh, um, uh, update, but uh, basically the WHO EMRO is not a specific geographical region, but it's really kind of a, a designation uh, under the uh, World Health Organization, which is a UN agency. So it's basically North Africa with the absence of Algeria that belongs to the African region under this. Um, um, designation. Um, so a few countries in the Horn of Africa, such as Somalia and Djibouti, and uh, um, uh, the Arabian, Arabian Peninsula, as well as Iran, Pakistan, and Afghanistan. So this is from the uh, manual that was uh, developed uh, for the uh, WHO uh, program, and this is uh, 100 plus pages as a kind of a reference manual called the Manual of School Mental Health. Uh, I had the honor of uh, being kind of the, the lead on this program, but together with a very large group of experts uh, uh, from, from the US, uh, from the UK, but also a lot of uh, regional and other international experts, including the WHO staff from the regional office and from the headquarters, as well as many um, collaborators and reviewers, both from the health and education sector, uh, as you see here listed uh, many in the region including also some other US, uh, not US, UN agencies, such as the uh, UNRWA in uh, uh, the, the refugee agency in Palestine. Um, uh, so it was really a kind of a, a large group of experts that helped uh, put this together. So this program is influenced by the developmental, behavioral, social, cognitive theories, focuses on mental illness prevention and promotion, so really a big em emphasis on prevention and promotion. Uh, it fosters a positive culture of well-being in schools alongside early identification and referral for, referral for more intensive mental health support and tiered in interventions that can be applied by teachers 
within a classroom setting. So really the emphasis of the program is the classroom. So yes, we talk about referral and obviously certain students need more help, but really a lot of emphasis is what could you do within your own classroom setting, both in terms of the prevention and promotion, but the early identification. And when you do identify a problem, what type of things could you do within your own classroom setting? So in more detail, what are the objectives of this uh, program? So one is helping educators understand the importance of mental health in schools, allowing educators to understand child development. Obviously very important, this understanding of uh, childhood development because the types of things that you expect from a six-year-old are very different than the type of things that you expect from a 14-year-old. So understanding the child development is very important. Providing age-appropriate behavioral management strategies, including discipline, uh, disciplining strategies. So how, how do you manage uh, uh, kind of classroom behavior? Identifying the warning signs of mental illness and really disting distinguishing them from uh, just kind of normal emotional distress that everybody goes through. Providing appropriate interventions for a variety of problems and providing further resources for educators. We are not asking teachers to become uh, you know, to diagnose um, or to treat. We are asking them to identify problems in a general sense to be able to say, yes, this child has a problem with their focus and these are the type of things we could do. We're not asking them to basically say that the, the, the problem is like ADHD or whatnot. The problem is a focus problem. And uh, based on that, uh, they could do certain interventions to help the students. Uh, so, uh, as I said, this program was developed for uh, Muslim countries in the Eastern Mediterranean region. And uh, unfortunately, uh, actually when I was preparing some of these uh, slides a while back, uh, I, I, I found this uh, very distressing um, news article about a, a student in Egypt. Her name was Basmala. She is nine years old. She was hit on the head with a wooden stick after she made a spelling mistake in an Arabic class and she actually lost her life. So when we say this is a matter of life and death, this is actually not an exaggeration. For some people, it is really a matter of life and death. But uh, for everybody else, including in the Canadian context, uh, you know, the, the experiences people have in school uh, are, are really, really important in uh, defining their uh, trajectory. Um, but for the work we do in the uh, Eastern Mediterranean region, uh, you know, we are still grappling with issues like physical discipline that uh, sometimes lead to uh, situations like that of uh, Basmala, where she very um, unfortunately lost uh, lost her life. Back to the uh, program itself. Um, so the program consists of lectures, group discussions, activities, and role plays, which I think is one of the most exciting parts of the program when we actually kind of play these roles of a you know student as having. Um, an anxiety problem about attending school and kind of how the teacher is trying to assist that student. And then the reference manual I mentioned earlier, which is uh, more than 100 pages of uh, references. Uh, we try to kind of make it uh, actionable. We try to make it also appropriate uh, for the different age groups because strategies used for uh, younger children are different than those used for adolescents, for example. The program itself uh, went through uh, different phases. So the initial phase was just kind of developing the manual, developing the materials, the lectures, the handouts, and then we moved into the training aspect with workshops and trainings. And then uh, phase three was kind of the dissemination and evaluation. I'm gonna share some of that data with you. This is one of the first meetings at the WHO EMRO headquarters in Cairo, Egypt, uh, kind of working with the different experts, trying to kind of get you know, kind of peer um, uh, review, peer support, understanding what are the priorities in the region itself uh, for, for this work. So these were some of the people's uh, people attending. Um, the manual itself is separated into different modules. I'll very quickly kind of show you some of the titles of the modules, so just so they have a more detailed sense of what it actually covers. So module one is social emotional childhood development. Um, so we talk about the developmental tasks of preschoolers and then primary school age children and then secondary school age children. We talk a little bit about moral development and then brain development and how it affects uh, schools, students in schools. And then module two, which is really the biggest part of this program. 
and that's the pro promotion and prevention. So what are the mental health promoting schools? What are the core values of a mental health promoting schools? What are the role of parents? Uh, the behavioral management strategies for schools. So discipline, management of destructive behavior, counseling, circle time, uh, a little bit about life skills, education, although that's uh, kind of a topic of its own, not the focus of the program itself, but we talk a little bit about you know, life skills education for students. And then um, the rest of the module two uh, dealt with other uh, health promoting efforts that impact mental health, like nutrition, vision, hearing, speech, physical exercise. And then some of the more contemporary issues like media and mental health related to screen time, internet addiction, cyberbullying, and uh, suicide uh, prevention. Module three is around addressing student mental health, the problems that we, we see when to refer for help. So we talked about behavioral manifestations of common mental health problems. Um, strategies were always divided into three tiers, and this is kind of what the WHO recommends in terms of school mental health programs. So tier one strategies are ones to address mild problems. There are strategies that are simple, could be uh, simple to implement, and would likely benefit all students regardless of the problems. Tier two strategies are to address more moderate problems or if the tier one strategies were ineffective and they would uh, require more um, tailored support for children who are identified. And then tier three strategies that are basically the most involved and they address severe problems or if tier two interventions are not sufficient to address the problem. Then we talked about when to refer for specialists for evaluation and treatment, and then the different roles and responsibilities within the school in regards to mental health. And then we end with case studies of common conditions encountered in schools. Those are culturally adapted and relevant to the uh, Muslim population that we uh, are uh, working with in the Asian Mediterranean region. And interventions, as I mentioned all, earlier, are all school-based. So again, it's about what you could do within your uh, school and classroom setting. These are some of the examples of the cases. Uh, of course, it's not a um, you know uh, an all kind of inclusive list, but uh, these were some of the kind of cases that were identified by our experts to be kind of the maybe the, some of the most common or the most relevant cases that are encountered in schools in the Eastern Mediterranean region. And I don't think they're much different than what we see in schools here in North America. And then we. Um, have an appendix that have further resources, uh, teacher wellness resources, examples of programs that exist in the Eastern Mediterranean region for school mental health, risk and protective factors for mental Ill illness, and then screening tools that can be used in schools. This was uh, one of the earlier trainings. So the model here is that we train new trainers. It's a TNT model. So this was one of the earlier trainings back in 2016, where we trained, uh, it was in Amman, Jordan. We trained people from several countries. These were some of the trainers. These were uh, some of the countries where we uh, trained uh, people. Uh, this was uh, from the UAE, where we've uh, actually done a lot of trainings. I actually just returned from there recently. We completed another set of trainings. This training uh, was in 2018. This one was 2019. Same, 2019. And this is... Uh, only a few weeks ago, uh, another training we conducted in Dubai. This was a training we conducted uh, in, in Pakistan. And these are some of the people, uh, the teachers who we trained in Pakistan. Uh, Pakistan, uh, as part of the, the project, have actually digitalized some of the training, and I'm going to have a chance to uh, show you some of that. Um, but um, as you can see here, also people kind of uh, looking at their tablets and doing some of the training uh, through uh, online resources. This is from Iran. Iran. These are from uh, Egypt. Egypt. Uh, as everything uh, after COVID, uh, some of uh, the trainings were also online. This was a training we did uh, actually in English uh, uh, for Bahrain. And then uh, we uh, had this project called SHINE, the School Health Implementation Network for the Eastern Mediterranean region, which was funded by the NIMH. And its aim was to scale up the school mental health um, program. And it was a combination of uh, uh, people from academia, NGOs, policymakers, 
implementation scientists from the Eastern Mediterranean region with support from international universities. Uh, so Shine's goal basically was uh, twofold. One was capacity building with a focus on Pakistan, Iran, Jordan, Egypt, and then implementation research for scale up, really trying to understand when you implement programs like that, um, what are the kind of real life problems that you run into? Um, and then there was a technology assisted approach for delivery. And uh, we were trying to kind of as a, on the research side to compare training that happens kind of live in the kind of more traditional model to training that is technology uh, assisted. So uh, our colleagues in, in Pakistan kind of converted the training uh, that, that we give usually over um, up to five days uh, in the TNT model to kind of an online training. As you see, this is kind of the so the interface of that. Um, and uh, as you see, kind of the online training, they try to kind of make it uh, somewhat simple, uh, a lot of uh, uh, kind of visual tools to kind of assist. Uh, and kind of maintain the, the focus of uh, the trainees uh, doing it online. They also uh, uh, built kind of an app uh, that includes a chatbot. So for example, someone in chatbot, a teacher could type um, a child who is hyperactive, it would kind of walk them through an algorithm and then kind of help them identify strategies that they can use to assist that child. The WHO itself has also made this training available online in English and in Arabic. And uh, this is from uh, one of our uh, publications, but just kind of looking at the number of people we've uh, trained. I mean, this is co uh, a moving, a constantly moving target because, um, you know, we are constantly training new people, but also who are training others. But uh, as of about a year ago, when this was submitted for publication, we had trained uh, more than 2,000 people from 653 schools in the countries listed here. Uh, some of the impact of the program in 2019, the program was adopted by Pakistan's president in an effort to promote and improve mental health in schools. In 2022, it was announced that Egypt is establishing a psychological support network in each educational district in the country, utilizing this program. Uh, hopefully, this actually does crystallize. Um, these are some of the pictures from uh, uh, from from Pakistan. Uh, so the the top left is uh, the uh, Pakistani president meeting with some of the team members uh, back in 2019. Uh, was his focus on harnessing technology for public mental health. Um, so the publications also from the program. If uh, folks are interested to uh, learn more about it, so there's the description of the program itself. Uh, there is a kind of a theory of change framework that we use to identify pathways for large-scale implementation of such programs in the Eastern Mediterranean region. Uh, one of the publications were, was around uh, technology-assisted teachers training. Um, with COVID, we also uh, published an advocacy piece kind of trying to make the case for the importance of school mental health. I mean, it's always been important, but certainly with COVID and the type of challenges that uh, we have seen kind of in the last few years, uh, I think school mental health programs become even more important. Studies have indicated the program is acceptable and feasible, including a study in inner city schools in Lahore, Pakistan, and in Abur district in Egypt. Another study from Pakistan showed that the program was effective in increasing teachers' mental health lit literacy and self-efficacy in classroom management and student engagement, as well as an overall improvement in the school environment. I'm just gonna end kind of with a, uh, a case, uh, just to kind of give you a, a little bit of a sense of uh, the, the, the maybe a kind of the module three cases. Uh, what are the type of things we uh, try to establish? So usually here we start with just a description of a case of I think a seven year old child who's having some school avoidance uh, problems, um, school anxiety problems, and how to address that. So in addressing some of these uh, problems, we focus, of course, on teachers, but also parents, but also peers, and what could diff these different groups help to assist uh, in, in, in the situation that we're up against. So for example, uh, in this particular case, where ref there's a refusal to separate from parents to attend school, 
Uh, some of the strategies that we try to help uh, teachers and parents implement. One is to make school more magnetic. So kind of try to set up something for the child to look forward to when they get to school. Maybe it's playing with a peer. Maybe it's spending time in kind of in the library or their favorite place. But also making home less magnetic. So that doesn't mean punishing the child if they stay home. But if they do stay home, they don't get to sleep in, watch their favorite uh, uh, TV uh, shows or play video games, right? Because that would um, only make it harder for them to return to school. Uh, you could allow parents to send in notes in the student's lunch uh, rather than um, phone the student while in school so they can send kind of a, a you know, a, 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 a note saying, I love you, you're strong, I, I'm thinking of you, you know, something like that. Have the student use strength cards of their like superheroes or maybe their favorite uh, Quranic verse to recall strengths and powers to manage stress. Uh, you can allow the child to spend uh, time at first in the library or with the other staff to ease into the building and of course rewards efforts to go into the classroom. Uh, introduce the student to next year's teacher and to have parents visit next year's classroom during a, a vacation interval. Identify a hierarchy of students to meet the child on arrival to school and other staff where the child can go if distressed during class time. So again, just an example here of uh, one of the cases, I guess, uh, you know, a more common case that we see of uh, school anxiety. These are some of the references uh, that I mentioned. And uh, this is my email. Uh, if anybody has uh, any questions, uh, please feel free to uh, reach out. And thank you very much for this opportunity. Zaklaser for the talk, Dr. Hamoda. I just wanted to ask a few questions that we have here. So one of the questions is just around some challenges that you might have encountered in implementing this program, just given the number of different regions that you've implemented in um, and number of different cultures and languages that you've had to adopt this to. So just wondering about any barriers that, that have come up. Yeah, I can uh, take another half hour probably to talk about different challenges. Uh, many, I think uh, one of the biggest, uh, just kind of, you know, bigger picture challenges, of course, is the variability that we have in the region. So, for example, and, and basically all types of variability, right? Uh, within kind of between the different countries in the region, but even within each country. So, for example, just the economic resources that you have. Uh, some we have some of the richest countries in the world in the Eastern Mediterranean region. You know, countries like Qatar, Saudi Arabia, the UAE, but also some of the uh, countries that are going through significant uh, challenges, whether uh, economic challenges in the poorest countries in the world, like uh, Somalia or Yemen, but many others that are going through wars. So there is no one size fits all, and. Um, you have to kind of be very creative and the way we try to approach this specific problem in a uh, pro, uh, pro, pro, uh, project like this is basically through the different tiers right so there are you know tier one interventions usually don't require a lot of resources so an example could be you know a child who has a problem paying attention should sit up front right it doesn't require really any resources it just requires knowledge that this is a strategy that you could use um so we try to approach this problem through the kind of the multi-tier interventions but i think uh, one of the biggest challenges of course is variability and within each single country you have more resource areas and less resource areas i think another big big problem is really the uh, problem of you know stigma and of course uh, this problem exists everywhere it exists here in the us it exists in canada but um for for those of us who've worked in the um region we know that this is a very, very significant problem. You know, um, a parent uh, uh, hearing from a teacher maybe that your child has some form of uh, mental health problem or whatnot could be very off-putting and could really, um, you know, just uh, kind of, that sometimes the conversation stops there. So a lot of times we're having conversations with teachers about also how to talk to parents about some of these problems. And again, as I mentioned earlier, the idea is not to try to make a diagnosis, but, you know, to approach the problem with empathy and kind of in a general sense, you could say, you know, we're noticing a problem in focus. We don't have to say, we think your child has ADHD or we think your child has a mental problem. 
you know so uh, again the language that you use uh is is very helpful but certainly stigma is a big issue not just with parents a lot of times also the teachers um i, I think another challenge kind of related to that I, I don't think there's a country that we've ever worked with where teachers are not overworked and underpaid so sometimes you go in with like okay we have a great program that uh we think will you know change the world and of course, kind of the first thing you hear is like, yeah, that's really cool, but we don't have time for this, right? So again, it's uh, important that we start with discussing with the teachers that this is really the, in the core of what they're doing, which is teaching. And this is really to help them be more effective teachers and to help their students be more effective um, learners. But I can go on and on with many more problems, but I'll, I'll stop with, uh, with these. Zazakar, no, I think that's a very, a really important point, you know, um, supporting our teachers as well and making sure that they have the resources and infrastructure to actually implement um, what's, what's, you know, outlined in this program. So it sounds like that's a really important uh, part of it and then the stigma portion as well. Uh, one last question is just, have you had any challenges in addressing kind of cultural differences that exist in how to approach, like, discipline and how to approach behavior? um and and how you've actually addressed some of that in the program for sure so again i think a very good example is physical discipline uh not to say that physical discipline happens the same way in every school in the eastern Mediterranean region i think there's a lot of variability there are countries that completely ban it uh, there are uh, many others that don't um and uh, as as you saw, I mean, there are students still dying uh, in, in in their classes. It's supposed to be you know a safe place for learning. So um, I, I think this is one challenge. Like sometimes a conversation kind of has to start with the kind of the very basics. Like why is physical discipline not kind of the right approach? Uh, I don't think that would be the case specifically here in the U.S. If we're you know uh, we do give trainings here in the U.S for teachers, like, because, you know, that's not really something that you see here in schools, but, you know, obviously working in the Eastern Mediterranean region, this is a lot of times kind of where the conversation starts. And of course you run into things like people saying, well, you know, I was beaten in school and I turned out okay, or I was physically disciplined at home and I, was, I turned out okay. And, you know, you just have to have some of these conversations kind of sharing that there are more effective strategies and certainly science does not support physical discipline, for example, as a kind of an appropriate kind of uh, disciplinary approach. So, um, so yeah, again, that's another kind of area of, I think, kind of a, a bit of a, a, maybe a cultural difference in terms of um, working uh, in the region. Uh, but, but certainly there, you know, there are many other examples, of course. Hey, Jazakwa, thank you for your time today, Dr. Hamada, and for joining us at the conference this year. We really appreciate it and look forward to having you come back in future years as well. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Malik, and thank you for all the attendees. I hope you have continued to have a wonderful experience at the conference. All right, I uh, pray that you all like that session by Dr. Hisham Hamouda. And the second part of this session, inshallah, uh, is going to be by Dr. Farah Islam. So she is a PhD, a mental health advocate, educator, and researcher. Dr. Islam holds an honors bachelor's of science in neuroscience from UFT, a master's in neuroscience from York, and a PhD in epidemiology from York. She explores mental health and service access in Canada's racialized and immigrant populations using mixed methods research and orients her research and community work around breaking down the barriers of mental health stigma. Dr. Islam is also the Director of Psycho-Spiritual Studies Department at the Yaqeen Institute for Islamic Research. And I will hand off the mic to Dr. Farah. Jazakallah khairan, Brother Ibrahim, really appreciate that very kind and warm introduction. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. It's so wonderful to be here. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, for this session, inshallah, we're going to be talking about and focusing on some of the, the issues that Islamic schools face when trying to offer social and emotional learning within the classroom setting and some strategies that we can do, inshallah. 
So just as, a, as an introduction, there are over 100 Islamic schools across Canada, subhanAllah. And, you know, knowledge is power. And so with this session, we really want to be honest about tackling some of the, the difficulties and the challenges that Islamic schools are facing in Canada. And just to, just to say and just to share, you know, I worked as an Islamic schools te teacher for a year, you know, straight out of undergrad. You know, subhanAllah, the, the challenges are real. So I fully empathize with all the educators out there. You know, so to, to talk about some of those challenges, I mean, really across the board, it, it really comes down to sort of lack of access, whether that's lack of access to mental health supports, lack of access to funding for mental health training for teachers, for uh, because as there are private schools, so they don't get the same access to uh, whether that's government funding or to, to the supports that the school board usually offers. So these are these are some of the sort of the resources that a, a public school often has. Has in, in terms of providing that mental health support to their students and providing that mental health training to their teachers. There's paid leave for mental health training, all sorts of, of amazing resources. But unfortunately for Islamic schools, this isn't the case, right? Um, oftentimes, Islamic schools are struggling to, you know, um, to get their, you know, feet off the ground, whether they're, they're a new school, struggling just to make ends meet, and academics are the top priority, and it's very difficult then to prioritize mental health. So what are then some of those challenges that Muslim youth face in, in, in Islamic schools? So uh, in my research, Hamdada, I did get, get a chance to work with South Asian youth across Peel region and a large subset of the, of the young people I spoke to were Muslim youth and many of the, the stakeholders, whether they were imams, educators, um, youth workers, mental health professionals were ones who have extensive experience with Muslim youth. And so there are a whole host of, of mental health challenges that young Muslims face, whether they're in the public school setting, whether they're in the Islamic school setting. I mean, they're, they're not immune from, from any of these challenges. And so I wanted to focus particularly on domestic violence to start out. Um, for example, this Muslim social worker uh, shared that uh, a lot of young Muslims do witness, for example, intimate, intimate partner violence, within the home or abuse happening within the home. Uh, they, uh, they are often witnessed, for example, seeing dad hitting mom um, and, or economic abuse or other forms of abuse happening within the home. And, and so the case scenario that, uh, that we developed out of that, for example, is, is the, the case scenario of Ahmed, who goes in to see a guidance counselor after his teacher raises concerns over his inattention in class and constant disruption of his peers. Ahmed feels like his teacher dislikes him and his parents are upset with his poor grades. And just to underline there, Ahmed is witness to intimate partner violence present within the home. So here you have a case of Ahmed sh showing sort of those externalized behavioral um, issues uh, as a result of what's going on in his home. And so I, I do want to just uh, say that, you know, as educators and guidance counselors, anyone working within the school system really has this unique vantage point that often, you know, parents don't get access to, right? As an observer, as a third party, they have a chance to see what's going on perhaps within the home what the child is bringing to school, and they also have a chance to witness what's happening within the classroom, whether they're being bullied or, or other issues that might be present within the classroom. And so oftentimes educators and guidance counselors are really the eyes that parents don't have. And, um, and so the educator has an incredible role of acting as a witness and as a mediator in these cases. And I just want to say, you know, in, in our deen, there is an honored role of being a mediator, right? Our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, for example, told us that, you know, being a mediator, putting things right between people, bringing families together, bringing people together who have fallen out or within dispute or within conflict is more excellent in degree than voluntary fasting, voluntary prayer, and, and giving sadaqah or giving charity, it's, it's it's an incredible um, role and an opportunity that we have as educators. Um, you know, just like, just like imams, for example, you know, educators are often the frontline defense when it comes to our, our young Muslims and their mental health, right? They're witness to crimes or injustice or pain that 
we simply don't see as parents or others outside of that. And so this comes with a great responsibility, but it is an honored responsibility that comes with a heavy burden. I, I do also want to say that, you know, I, uh, I mentioned that I was an Islamic school teacher for a year and it was in a, is a diff, it was in a difficult part of town. And I remember, you know, some of my little students would come to me sometimes whom I adored. You know, I still have some of their crayon drawings, you know, that I've saved after all these years. And, you know, I remember they would come sometimes and show me the bruises on their body and they would share stories about what happened in their home. And they would beg me not to tell anybody about it. And I felt powerless, right, SubhanAllah. And I, I came home so many days just in tears. And we don't want our educators to feel that powerlessness, right? We need to empower them so that they can act and take steps to prevent further harm. And I totally understand, I fully empathize that there is a huge stigma against reporting, right? It's not just educators who feel inhibited from saying something when they do see something or are privy to some information. Right. Young people themselves obviously are, are, are hugely stigmatized or are, are feel, feel very inhibited from sharing. Right. They're very afraid that they will be taken away from their parents. So they remain quiet and generally don't report it. And this was uh, said from uh, a guidance counselor who works in an Islamic school here in the GTA. And so I do, though, I you know when I. I um, mentioned that hadith earlier, right? Oftentimes when we read that hadith, we just solely focus on the last part of it, where it says that spoiling relations is the shaver, right? That it destroys the deen. I want us to take a different perspective and understand it uh, a little bit further. You know, when we don't report abuse, when we are witness to, to injustice or difficulties, um, pain that is happening within a family, it may be that that particular family if we do report it, may get broken. That's true. But we don't know that, right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. It might be that it might be a means of reconciliation for the family and of healing, right? But if we only look at that small view of that one family, that's all we see. But I want us to be able to, to zoom out and take sort of a macro level approach here. You know, yes, one family could be broken. Again, we don't know. It might be that they might reconcile later on. But raising your concerns allows that family and the children in that family a chance to actually get help and to, and to heal, right? It can be a wake-up call, right? The parents might have a chance to work on their marriage and reconcile if it's possible. The children of that family also have a fighting chance then that when it comes time for them to create their own families, they can build one rooted in respect and kindness and nurturing right? And love, right? Think of the generations of families that you can then help to save, right? Think of the, the profound sadaqa jariyah that is, subhanAllah. So may, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us a tawfiq to be able to, to, to stand up and to be able to say, you know, enough is enough with the cycles of violence, right? That as an educator, as a witness, as a mediator, I do have a profound role to help end uh, what what may be toxic patterns of abuse or pain or unhealthy communication within the home. Just to remember, again, the, the beautiful opportunity for Sadaqa Jariya that you have as an educator, as a guidance counselor. So what are some tools then that we can, um, we can implement within the school setting? So there are actually uh, several school-based interventions for dealing with domestic violence. And just to, again, return to Ahmed's case, you know, Ahmed, you know, when he went to school, he had all these externalized behavioral issues, right? He was acting out in class, being disruptive, um, in, you know, being maybe a class clown, etc. But there are many times when uh, a young person faces or witnesses uh, abuse or violence within the home, and how that manifests is internalized behavioral problems. So they may, um, you know, start to withdraw, they might become mute in class, they might not uh, take part or participate and or do well in the in the activities in school that they used to enjoy right and so those young people often get overlooked and it is so important to be able to understand that um, young people you know may be showing different behavioral issues or social skill deficits or declines in academic functioning in different ways and to understand and not to overlook all the young people who are potentially facing difficulties 
And so with all these school-based interventions, what kind of goes, um, what kind of comes up over and over again is basically the, the healing power of play, basically, subhanAllah. And uh, particularly for this one, what I re really liked about this particular inter intervention was that it didn't require mental health professionals, right? Non-mental health professionals could be trained to, to carry out these really important school-based interventions. And this one too had this great uh, expressive or uh, arts-based kind of element to it where young people are given a safe space to be able to share what's happened to them. Maybe that's not in words, maybe that's not done verbally, but through acting it out um, silently, for example, as well. So it just gives them uh, a chance to, to give voice to their pain in a way that feels safe, which is, which is so powerful and so healing. And so, and also I, I do want to say again, you know, as, as educators, we, it, we don't ever want them to feel in a place of powerlessness, right? We do want them to feel armed with the knowledge and the tools that if they are witnessing something in the classroom, they can do something to be able to help. And so, for example, the Ontario College of Teachers has uh, some great resources, modules, training on what uh, a, an educator can do in that situation. Similarly, Vega is a really great um, training and, and resource that has, you know, training modules, videos, all kinds of things for educators to be able to understand uh, and recognize family violence when it is occurring and to how to, and steps that they can take to prevent recurrence of further harm. And I do want us to say that if it's the case that oftentimes in Islamic schools, we feel that incredible stigma or that pressure, we feel inhibited from actually reporting when we are seeing or witnessing uh, cases of domestic violence within, within the families of our students, then having really great connections with these wonderful resources that we have within the community that are working in the space of domestic violence, whether that's Nisa Homes, Sikina Homes, Nisa Helpline, Nasiha Mental Health as well, all of them are doing brilliant work in this space. And so having those community connections and and having a, sort of a directory of trusted Muslim mental health professionals, et cetera, can really help Islamic schools take that next step of, of what, what can be done when they are presented with a difficult case. And I, I also, just to return to the case scenario of Ahmed as well, right? Oftentimes, generally speaking, that part of of Ahmed being witness to intimate partner violence in the home is generally masked, as in you have to have extreme rapport and um, a, a great relationship with your students to, to actually unmask that. And it's, it's very difficult oftentimes. So what it presents as in the classroom is just that externalized behavioral, uh, those issues such as inattention and constant disruption of their peers. So how do we tackle that? So what are, what are some school-based interventions there? So one of the challenges that Islamic schools often have and often face is sort of the behavioral focus when it comes to uh, issues within the classroom, right? It's often the case that it's a, the classroom is often a setting of power and control, right? But we do need to understand that a child is communicating something with that behavior, right? That behavior is coming from somewhere. And when we don't understand those deeper issues such as domestic violence, for example, having in the, happening within the home, then we don't get the full story and we're just seeing the external behavior on the outside. And so rather than punishing that behavior and stopping there, we do need to dig deeper and understand what is actually going on, right? And so the, the sh we have to shift sort of the paradigm from a child is to be seen and not heard or a child is someone you command absolute obedience from, etc. Those are those paradigms that we are trying to shift away from, inshallah, because in that type of environment of power and control, a student's mental health cannot be nurtured. You know, and in our deen, alhamdulillah, we also have this sort of beautiful perspective, this idea that tarbiyah, this idea of taking our children stage by stage, step by step, and that's how we nurture them. This idea of ta'deeb, of, of nurturing manners and discipline into our children. This idea that tarbiyah and ta'deeb lay the foundation before we get to ta'adim, before we get to instruction or facilitating knowledge. And so oftentimes, for example, you know, we talk about connection before correction. Well, in Islam, we also have this idea of connection before instruction, for example, or connection before knowledge. But oftentimes, when Islamic schools have solely that academic focus, right, it's 
then we only focus on the ta'aleem to the detriment of tarbiyah and ta'deeb and forgetting that we need to, to nurture that relationship and connection with our young students before ta'aleem, before education or knowledge can ever take root. And so, for example, one of our scholars said, you know, to raise your child, you must first raise yourself. And I think that's such beautiful advice, too. And here, even more beautiful and sage wisdom is from Ali ibn Abi Talib, radiallahu anhu, who said, do not raise your children the way your parents raised you, for you were born, for they were born for a different time. And so in our context as educators, do not teach your students the way your teachers taught you, for they were born for a different time. Right? What it requires from us is to understand that our young people are growing up in a world that's very different from the world we grew up in. Right? We know that you know, there are many ahadith, many traditions that tell us that tribulations or fitna will increase as we near the end of times, right? So we know the world our young Muslims are facing is radically different from the one that we grew up in. And so this requires us then with the to have the flexibility to shift our paradigms, to change with the times and with the context. And so we need to adapt our change, our, our teaching. So what are some of those tools and resources then when we are seeing perhaps some of those behavioral issues in, in the classroom, what can we do? So there are a whole host of, of very evidence-based, school-based mindfulness types of interventions. And they have a whole host of, of great um, benefits, whether that's, you know, increasing self-regulation, decreasing hyperactivity, wonderful benefits. This one particularly called Mind Up um, was, uh, they had many, uh, many studies done on this particular uh, intervention. What I particularly like about it is that the students get to collectively engage in a community service project, which I think is so cool. It's like doing a community sadaqa project all together, but such a wonderful way to teach, uh, to teach young people. And so I think in the, in the Muslim community, I feel like we have such opportunity. Right? Alhamdulillah, we have so many Islamic meditation or contemplation apps right? And so why can't we do a sort of collaboration between Islamic schools and, and our wonderful Islamic meditation or contemplation apps uh, and develop a sort of mind up program that, that can be rolled out to students in the classroom setting, right? For example, a Sabr has uh, a, a kids module as well, right? So for kids contemplation, which is which is fantastic, right? So we could develop something like a taqwa up or a muraqaba up or something, right? But just help students bring that tafakkur, that dhikr, that idea of reflection, that stillness into their lives. Think about what that could do for their iman, right? Subhanallah. Um, and there are other many other uh, wonderful resources out there as well to understand mindfulness or contemplation to fakur from a, an Islamic uh, viewpoint, inshallah, as well. So let's let's shift from domestic violence and behavioral uh, issues. Uh, let's move to to the challenge of bullying that we also are seeing in Islamic schools. So uh, this guidance counselor, for example, shared that um, that uh, young Muslims also face bullying within Islamic schools, right? Maybe when they're in the public school setting, they might be of an Islamophobic nature, but race still plays a huge part in bullying, even when it comes to Islamic schools, where we can see shadism, where we can see anti-Black racism that's present within our communities, or just generally young people are bullied based on, you know, not being athletic enough or not being outgoing enough, et cetera, just the regular run-of-the-mill things that everybody gets bullied about. And so we do have some great resources for educators to be able to talk about anti-Black racism or talk about shadism and have these really honest, deep conversations about race and racism within the, within the classroom. So here's one, a, a great report sent out by the by Tessellate Institute. Uh, we also have, for example, Family and Youth Institute has, has put out a great toolkit and, and um, Beyond Bilal is a great Black history in Islam type of uh, a wonderful education program. Again, we can try to emulate these types of programs within the classroom as well to help uh, our, young, our young students understand what's actually going on. And so here's a case scenario we can look at uh, with a case of bullying as well. So here, Samira is a high school senior. She's the star of the soccer team. Her coach alerted the guidance counselor when she noticed that Samira had lost a, a great amount of weight. And when the coach approached her, Samira opened up about being bullied. 
and she uh, she mentioned that she was being trolled on social media, a lot of messages about her looking too much or being too much like a boy. And so Samira's, uh, Samira says her parents praised actually all her weight loss, though it's come to unhealthy levels because it makes her look more attractive for marriage prospects. So this is based as sort of a composite based on uh, several different cases as well. And so as well, my research, uh, what, what stakeholders also mentioned was that young Muslims do face sort of being treated differently their sisters their sisters are treated different from brothers within the same household and how uh, this is this impacts their mental health right for example we have um, cases of young girls who come to see a mental health professional uh, and they've begun to question for example their gender identity sometimes in some cases their sexuality as well you know, we live in difficult times and we have cases where young Muslim, young Muslim women, for example, might come to a mental health professional balking against sort of the stereotype of the weak, submissive woman that has been displayed to them, whether that's at home by their mother or by other female relatives or by their community. And so this can lead and there are cases with that this leads a young person down a, a difficult path of questioning their gender identity sometimes their sexuality as well. And um, with further counseling and the, the young person continues to see the mental health professional and they begin to understand that it wasn't their, their gender identity or their sexuality that they were rejecting, but rather these very stereotypical and rigid gender roles that they were, that they were rejecting instead. And that's, that's just, it's a very difficult place that our young people are in. So what tools and resources do we have to help young Muslims within that classroom setting? There are actually school-based interventions to try to reduce sort of gender stereotyping, some of that prejudice that uh, we see often pre uh, present. Um, and, and what's particularly powerful is that, you know, and important to understand about these interventions is that when young people are only presented with very rigid gender roles or stereotypes, for example, you know, the colonial gaze teaches us that, you know, Muslim women are pathetic and subservient or oppressed, et cetera, right? Or our young Muslim men are taught that they're violent, right? These are the messages that we're receiving. And this view is so pervasive, generally speaking. And these prejudice messages can lead young Muslims to feel a deep level of self-hate and which can then in turn damage their self-concept. So we really do have to work on, on counteracting uh, these messages. And so we understand, of course, um, as Muslims, our definitions of gender, gender roles, gender identity, sexuality, you know, obviously uh, are different. And so they, we need to develop our own sort of school-based interventions to teach young Muslim boys and girls and youth about healthy Muslim masculinity, healthy Muslim femininity that is not laden with the cultural tropes and baggage or definitions of femininity and masculinity that may have arisen as a result of colonialism, right, that are antithetical to Islam. Right, our young people need to be armed with uh, knowledge to be able to distinguish between what is Islam, what is culture, what is colonial, uh, what is the result of colonial tropes, right? Otherwise, their rejection of gender stereotypes can lead them to also reject their Islam, and we don't want them to be in that place. And so, as well, um, uh, this wonderful toolkit also has great school workshops uh, outlined, and it's just one very important part of healthy Muslim male masculinity is for young boys and men to understand the incredible and profound role they have in ending family violence. Another way that we can help to counteract some of the prejudice messages of, of gender roles is to increase Muslim role models, right? In Islamic schools, often the the gender gap or the gender divide, generally speaking, the vast majority of the educators are women. Right, but young boys really need to see male role models. They need to see male educators, coaches, teachers, others filling that roles. And they actually really crave these types of role models because they're often completely absent in our Islamic schools. And I think, you know, Dr. Sherman Jackson, many years ago at an RIS convention, once said it best. He said something like, we need to develop our own Muslim cool, <laughs> which I really loved. But basically, you know, um, as a Muslim community, we need to have our own role models who are relatable and real, who get it, 
right? Who can actually get down to the level of what young people are facing and going through. You know, in an era of social media influencers hijacking Muslim masculinity and femininity, we need to redefine our own Muslim cool, right? And educators can help students find Muslim role models to look up to. They can feature uh, Muslim role models like this, like this in the classroom. Um, Be Me, for example, has a great legacy tour. So young women can learn about the great Muslims of the past, like Fatima Al-Fihri and other wonderful trailblazers. And we can bring these kinds of lessons into the classroom to give them, again, that, that idea of healthy Muslim masculinity and femininity. And so, so what can we do to actually promote the mental health needs of students? What else can we do? For, um, you know, there are some fantastic free resources for professional development for us in Canada or in Ontario, School of Mental Health Ontario, uh, EduGains. There are just some great mental health training and supports uh, that if Islamic school teachers could be, could be encouraged to, to be able to, to partake in. There's also fantastic mental health first aid training, for example, or assist to have suicide intervention skills. Very important for every educator to, to have this type of training, inshallah. I also, I want to give a shout out to a lot of community initiatives that have kind of jumped in, saw that there was a need, there was a gap that, that Islamic schools teachers need this kind of um, sort of whether that's support, basically. And so, for example, Be Me does um, workshops with young kids some of them are are on mental health within within islamic school sound vision offers weekend and islamic school teachers training and they're also going to be working on one that's going to be focused on mental health and nasiha is having a great educators retreat coming up in february just great community initiatives just out there trying to support the incredible work that islamic school teachers are doing every day and in the public school system for example there are a whole host of um, kind of companies out there like Unlearn and others that offer training. And so basically as a Muslim community, we are trying to develop amazing resources like this to offer the training that our Islamic school teachers uh, really need and, and, and really want, right, SubhanAllah. Also, uh, there are great community research initiatives as well as the Family Youth Institute and others are putting out great, um, great reports. And MAC schools, Safa and Marwa Islamic School, for example, has an, an annual student-led mental health uh, initiative. Fantastic work going on. And, and so really the last point I just want to just want to make that, you know, I know that we're strapped for uh, funding and resources. So if there can be collaboration with Muslim educators in the public school system, with those in the Islamic school system, there can be that provision of expertise and training, uh, inshallah, as well as just uh, tapping into the incredible parent body, basically, that we have, uh, who are eager and willing to, to help out as much as they they can. Muslim mental health professionals send their kids to schools as well. So just tapping into that resource. And we always hear it takes a village to raise a child. Well, it takes an ummah to raise a child. And you as an educator out there, you are an incredible, critical role of that village. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward you for that struggle. I mean, jazakumullah khairan. Jazana wa Dr. Farah. We're like maybe 10 minutes over time, but I do want to, you know, address at least one question from uh, the chat if we have time for that. Um, so I could read it out for you. So we have a question that said most parents equate school social workers and, and mental health workers with the Children Aid Society, and they don't tend to collaborate with them often. Um, so I don't know if you had any advice or any research findings that can address how can this perception be changed? That's right. I, I think because of that discomfort, I think it makes so much sense to for then the Islamic schools to be able to collaborate with the Muslim community work that we have going on in that space, for example, Sakina Homes or uh, Nisa Homes and asking them to uh, offer kind of those referrals, etc. But if that's who maybe Islamic schools feel comfortable going to, then let's take that first step at least and then inshallah to, to go further. Inshallah, Jazakallah khair, Dr. Farah. That was a very informative and educating session. I mean, I, uh, I'm running out of words for uh, how much I've learned just from that session. May Allah continue to bless the work that you're doing within your clean and all of your research, inshallah. So our next session is uh, Eating Disorders and Muslim Youth. Who am I fasting for? And this will um, 
involve Dr. Sarah Smith, Dr. Nazila Iskandarova, and Samiha Rahman. And I will hand over the mic to uh, the moderator for the next session, inshallah.